Hi, this is Lori Power, Director of Evangelization and Discipleship at Christ the Redeemer Parish, and welcome to Talking Saints. I'm here today with my co-host, Pete Sanchez, reporter for the Catholic Star Herald. How are you today, Pete? I'm doing well, Lori. Uh, How are you? I'm great. This is a wonderful feast day and a wonderful saint we're going to talk about today. One who I really love and who I think she kind of picked me. And we'll, I guess we'll talk a little bit about that as we go I'm through her life. In that. <laughs> so this, of course, is Saint Therese of Lisieux, who is also known as the Little Flower or Saint Teresa of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face. She goes by a lot of different names, which we'll talk about why. Um, but she died at the young age of 24 and has had an incredible impact on the church and on individual Catholics. So many people devoted to her. And I think she's been showering roses from heaven since the time she died. And she even, as we'll talk about later, uh, has been named a doctor of the church. So this is a this is a huge, uh, huge saint we're talking about. Though, of the two Teresas, she's usually called Little Teresa because of her little way. So we will get into all of that. Um, Pete, do you want to start with her early life? Sure. Well, I, little Teresa, I think I don't think some people might view that as a uh, as an insult, but I, I don't think for her she would see that. No, not at no. all. She would love she would love it honestly, just the way she lived her life. But uh, I was very happy to hear that she has a January birthday. <laughs> go, go January birthdays. Born January second, eighteen seventy three, in France as Marie Francois Therese Martin uh, to Louis and Zelie. Is that mm, how you pronounce it? Yeah, other name and, and Louis. And what's interesting, her family was very devout. Um, Louis and Zelie were both rejected by orders. Uh, Zelie tried to enter uh, an order of nuns, while Louis tried to enter a monastery, and both of them were rejected. Yes, and clearly God had other plans. <laughs> yes. And they were going they, to raise some very holy children. <laughs> and should we mention that they too are saints? Yes, yeah. they were canonized in 2016, both of them. Yeah, so it's it, it just a uh, Therese came from a pedigree, and unfortunately, her her mother died at the age of four. Yes. Prior uh, to that, though, she said she had an extremely happy childhood. She just be she remembers being surrounded by love, and since she was the baby in the family, she was everyone's favorite, especially her mother's. So it was very sad when ultimately, at the age of four, when she was only four, her mother passed away. Apparently, she had been um, ill with cancer for quite some time. And then, yes, passed when Therese was only four. So that was a huge loss for her, certainly. And then she, but she was still, yeah, she was still known as in some ways cheerful, very religious. And at the age of nine, uh, she realized like her mother wanted, you know, desired, she wanted to be a nun. And and as well, she, her two of her sisters were already in the Carmelite right. order at this time, right? That's right. So, and, and I it was love- interesting, after her mother died, her oldest sister, Pauline, became like a second mother to her. So when Pauline entered the convent, that was almost like a second loss for her mm. because, but also when she was praying about entering the, the Carmel, she knew that you know, her sisters were there. So that's certainly an, an added, um, I think that was an added attraction, though it clearly, I think it was God calling her to that life. And then you, I think you said the causes for canonization for her sisters are up yes, too, right? Yes, all four of her sisters became nuns, and I believe all of their causes are also open right now too. So that was an incredibly holy family. So if there are any parents listening and you uh, need saints to pray to, <laughs> to help raise really holy children, uh, the Martins, uh, Louis and Zelly, would be great intercessors for you. I agree. I agree. The uh, so this, I love this story, Lori. We were laughing about this uh, while on a trip to Rome with her father. Uh, she, I, I don't know how she, how one gets permission to see the Pope. I, I think don't she know had an audience work. with them, and yeah. they were told, they were instructed, you are to say, you are to keep silence when you are in the presence of the Pope because there's just not enough time for everyone to speak with him personally. <laughs> so when she heard this, she, her sister was there. She looked to her sister, and her sister said, speak. <laughs> that was her advice. Uh, yeah, so of course, she threw herself at the feet of the Pope and said, asked, he said, I've asked the bishop already. I want to enter the Carmel. But she was only, I think, 14 at the time so that's why they they told her no she was just too young and he said oh well just you know listen to what your superior said if say if it's god's will you will enter and she persisted she said but if you say yes holy father how can 
they disagree. But he, of course, said, listen to your superiors. And um, ultimately, the superiors did say yes, even though mm-hmm. she was quite young. And she, she was 15 when she entered, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, did you mention, I think you, you normally enter at 16. That I'm not sure at that time. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, today, okay. I think you'd probably have to be even 18 or older, but I'm not sure. But yes, that was unusual even at that time yeah, to, she was, to enter so young. Suffice to say, she was the youngest Carmelite there. and she um... <laughs> Indeed. And there were only, at the time, 24 sisters who oh. were living there. And uh, yeah, she was only 15 years and three months old. So oh. she was still kind of a child herself. And she uh, initially she did uh, in her in keeping with uh, you know, kind of her life the first t- first couple months she was there I believe she swept uh, the corridors and she was an assistant doorkeeper mm. which I guess means you open the door to you, you greet know more people about that? probably you greet people? Yeah, yeah I would guess anybody that would come to visit because typically I would imagine they were cloistered so there has to be one person that would deal with those who are visiting and who are stopping by the. And Carmel just, for different reasons. That's a good question, Lori. For our listeners who who hear you just say the word cloistered and are kind of um, confused, you know, <laughs> like what? Well, can you explain what is what's a cloistered Cloister. monastery? So, uh, first, I should back up and say there are two types of women religious. So there are sisters who would be living out in the world and having an active apostolate. So oftentimes, um, sisters who teach. They would be religious sisters. But then there are nuns who are cloistered and they would go and live at a particular convent or monastery and they would stay there most likely their entire lives. Um, The only reason they would move is if maybe the the monastery closed or they all had to relocate. But they would make a commitment to live their entire lives there. And really, um, the way Therese would describe it is she was entering the desert with Jesus and with her other companions, the other sisters there. And they really, uh, they cut themselves off really from outside contact and really wanted to focus on being with Jesus and interceding for the world. So yes, they, it was a cloister. So those living in inside got very close to one another and the goal was also to together get close to jesus yeah. so it is Thank quite a, quite a sacrifice though because oh, men, they wouldn't be able to attend family events if you know if she had fa- when even when her father died she obviously was not with him her younger or her older sister celine did stay with him until he died and then she entered the carmel too but mm. things like that she only got to see her father that was one of the things after she entered um, that was still sort of like a dark cloud. Um, she was so happy to enter the Carmel, but her father had been sick and he had a series of strokes and ultimately became paralyzed. And that was a suffering for her that she couldn't be with him. So, but Celine was with him. So, oh, that's how oh, he was I'm glad not alone. to hear that. And mm-hmm. just somebody was with, and you know, speaking of suffering, Lori, uh, unfortunately in 1896, uh, she, um, she would have been 20. 24 at this time or i think um or maybe maybe not yet um she woke to a mouthful of blood Mm. and endured intense suffering uh and then uh she was diagnosed with tuberculosis Tuberculosis. yes and uh this 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 was a trying time for her but she did see the daily hardships of life as a test from god and she wrote uh i would like to perform the most heroic deeds i feel i have the courage of a crusader and so I, she saw this as heroism, courage mm. to endure suffering. And she also had some issues, Lori, maybe you can, you know, issues with her sisters in some ways, <laughs> right? Or is that the right word? Okay. So she, uh, after being in the convent a few years, developed the spirituality that we know today as the little way. She realized she wanted to do these great heroic things. She wanted to be a missionary, but she was cloistered, which means she would never leave the the Carmel. So she felt like her vocation was to love and anyone can love anywhere. And so she chose to love the people that were closest to her, particularly when they were most annoying or, or when it was just trying for her. And so, for example, there was a sister who apparently made some kind of noise when they were in the chapel together. Either she was tapping something or um, maybe she, I, I'm not sure what it was. It could have been like dentures that made funny sounds when she was sitting near her. And she's like, how am I supposed to pray when I have this constant noise? And she made that noise. She incorporated it into her prayer. Like that became what she offered it to 
to Jesus and said, okay, well, this is just something I have to endure. (laughs) But she got so used to it that there was a day when that sister wasn't there and she found that she couldn't pray because she didn't have that noise. (laughs) It had become such a part of, of what she offered to God when she was praying. So just really accepting those you know, little hardships, or even just going out of her way to be loving to those who were difficult. So there was a sister apparently in the community who people found pretty disagreeable. And Therese went out of her way to be kind to her, to to spend time with her at recreation, just to to befriend her. Um, So much so that after she died, that the the sister said, oh, Therese was one of my best friends. (laughs) So you could see how much she just... Uh, It was just little things. She wasn't doing anything huge. It was just loving the people that were right in front of her and accepting the little trials and the little hardships of daily life. And to realize, too, that you don't, yeah, you don't need to go out. um, I mean, if you want to, you know, go ahead, but, but don't put pressure on yourself to... Right. And obviously that was not her call. If she, no. if God called her to the Carmel, she was not supposed to be a foreign missionary. Yeah. <laughs> God made it clear what his will was for her. So... Yeah. And she, uh, and she died, unfortunately, the, she died at early at the age of 24. Mm. And I love it. Uh, she said, uh, near the end of her life, she wrote, I will spend my heaven doing good on earth. So she still intercedes for us today. And Lori, I want to uh, ask you, because you, uh, you have an interesting, uh, it's, it, St. Therese has been, you, you think she called you. In a <laughs> I, way. Think so. Pick, I think she picked, picked you. me. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> to be one of my patrons and intercessors. So when I was five, I started kindergarten at St. Teresa's School. So, of course, we got to know Therese a little bit because um, we would celebrate her feast day and we'd always see her statue whenever we would go over to the church. But I didn't know too much about her. Um, then as I got a little bit older, I did uh, come across her autobiography, which is called The Story of a Soul. Very famous work. I mean, it was published the year after she died and was hmm. widely read. I think that had something to do with... Um, her popularity and and how quickly she was canonized. So when I first read it, I just happened to come upon the parts where she seems to be just very um, sort of unhappy and and sort of complaining about all of the hard things that are happening in her life. I was like, oh, I don't know if I like this saint very much, but she did suffer quite a bit. And then I came upon her again um, when I was in the convent. I picked up the autobiography and started reading it. And I said, oh, this is beautiful. I guess I just needed to, it wasn't the time yet that I would, uh, you know, sort of take her as a, as a patron until that point uh, and really accept her. Though she had been chasing me. I had even with friends, friends had encouraged me to pray the novena to her because uh, when she's going to answer your prayer, she sends roses. And one year, uh, we, I think we were both at an event. It was a young adult event. Um, they had a little raffle of a, a St. Therese statue, and I actually won that year. So one of uh, our friends said, look, she even gave you herself. <laughs> so yeah, I think she's been, she's been chasing me down. But she has a beautiful, the little way is not only doing kind acts and, and loving those around you. She also thought of herself as very little. And she knew, the way she put it, she could not climb the rough stairway to perfection the way other saints did. She felt like she was too weak and too little. So what she would do is in her own littleness, just reach out to God's mercy. And like a little child who puts up their hands to their parent to pick them up, she would do that to Jesus and ask Jesus to lift her up to the heights of sanctity and bring her to heaven. So part of her little way was just remind, remembering how little she was and, trust, and trusting herself completely. She made an offering to merciful love, asking him to just pour down all the mercy that other people refused, receive all that mercy and bring her to heaven. So I was on a retreat and the retreat master asked everybody, um, he was talking about St. Therese. He said, well, what did St. Therese die of? And people were quiet, but then someone shouted out tuberculosis. And he said, no, she died of love. She just happened to be sick with tuberculosis at the time. So, and I think that's true. Her last words were, my God, I love you. So I think that sums up her life beautifully. Yeah, I think so. And, so what inspires you about St. Therese? Well, she just seems like she's a small, she's, she's small way, but with the biggest heart. Mm. And... One of the things that I keep coming back to, um, you know, you're talking about her life, and it made me flash back to when I was little, uh, growing up, and every summer we'd go to Texas, 
and I just remember, you know, we'd walk around the Alamo or we go, you know, Texas was in the summer, July, August heat in Texas is unlike any heat. Mm. I mean, you think it's hot here. <laughs> It is brutal. Like Texas, beautiful, beautiful land. Uh, I love my family there. Um, unbearably hot. And I just remember walking, you know, walking around and just like, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, just complaining. And, uh, you know, it's so hot. Can we stop? I'm hungry. I need water. And my parents would say, offer it up. Mm -hmm. And that does sound a little trite. <laughs> Uh, forgive me, but my family, you know, we joke about, it. oh, offer it up, offer it up. But I think, you know, the way you were talking about St. Therese, I think it, uh, it makes it so like, it makes it a whole lot clearer now mm. in that we can offer up those little sacrifices, whatever they may be. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I admit, you know, I had the privilege of being on summer vacation and it was hot and here I am complaining mm. other people are going through so much worse right now especially during this time of COVID-19 um I you know I don't I don't want to say to them offer it up because that does sound a little honestly might sound a little patronizing mm. but I do think there's a truth and a kernel of what God wants from us. Am I, absolutely. am I, what do you think? Oh Lori? no, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's some beauty to the fact that we can unite our sufferings to Jesus's sufferings and then they have immense value, value beyond what on our own we could have for the salvation of souls. So I think to other Catholics, I think it's perfectly fine to say, you know, offer it up to Jesus because he's suffering with you, whatever you're suffering. Okay. You know, I like that. <laughs> I like that to Jesus on the end. Yeah. I think that sounds a little less patronizing. That's true. <laughs> um, so yeah, offer it up to Jesus. I do like that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just, so I think yeah, she um, just pretty pretty remarkable. This uh, the life of this young. She died at twenty four. We just and she uh, was when she was canonized. If she had been alive, she would only have been fifty four. So thirty years late, yeah. later, that's incredible. You think it's somebody like Saint Peter Claver. Uh, who we talked about last month, he died at 73. Mm -hmm. And she died 50, almost 50 years earlier. Um, but no less of an, she had no less of an impact mm -hmm. than he did. And I think that's remarkable how somebody, and it, it just shows what any of us can do every day. We can do small things for the Lord in our own way. We don't, you know, I think, I think, um, People look, I know I'm speaking for myself, but I can look to Instagram and Facebook for validation. You know, I get a dopamine rush from the likes and the shares that I get for certain things. But ultimately, um, I should remember that I live for an audience of one. Yes. The Lord. And Amen. I think that's what St. Therese did. And she was, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to lie. I think she had, Lauren, you know better than me. She had her dark night mm, experiences. Yes. Yeah. Um, but she... She was faithful. She was. She was. And I think that's what we have to remember to be. Our only, the only critic we should really trust or even look to is the Lord. And uh, I, I just, I'm, you know, here I am, uh, late thirties and, uh, it's just, you know, it, it's, some people can say, what can a, what can a teenage girl who died at 24 teach you? And I think she can teach me humility and teach me, uh, you know, to just, um, just live quietly. You know, they don't have to, don't have to say much, and, but, you know, and I, I think actions speak louder than words. Mm. And, uh, I don't know. I think I think she's relatable to anybody. Absolutely. And I if agree. you think not, you can talk to me. So <laughs> pick up her autobiography, Story of the Soul. Yes. And might uh, learn, get a little more insight into her life. Okay. So. And well, Lori, do you have anything else to I about her life? I don't think so. Or? We have a prayer. So she was known as the little flower uh, because she said she would spend her heaven doing good on earth and she would shower roses upon all those who asked for her prayers. So we have a little prayer asking her to send us a rose to close. O little Therese of the child Jesus, please pick for me a rose from the heavenly garden and send it to me as a message of love. 
O little flower of Jesus, ask God to grant the favors I now place with confidence in your hands. St. Therese, help me to always believe as you did in God's great love for me so that I may imitate your little way each day. St. Therese, pray pray for for us. us.